Well, good morning, good afternoon. This is Scott with ReadySquirrel.com coming at you with how to start long-term food storage, the basics. This is a big subject, and I tried really hard not to go down the rabbit hole on this. Uh, I'm not a professional. Uh, I'm writing these articles as I'm doing the research um, for my own families, uh, to build my own family's uh, long-term emergency food storage. Uh, you can find this article on ReadySquirrel.com if you don't want to watch the, the video and listen to me gab. Um, how to start long-term food storage, the basics. Uh, my goal in this is not to give a, like a comprehensive uh, written document of how, you know, I'm not getting down to the extremes nuts and bolts here because this article would be a book. This is basically a primer, so somebody that's starting out would will have the framework to go out and to do their own research and give them an idea of the kind of things that they want to think about um, in regards to food storage. If you see any major gaps in this or if you see anything that you would suggest I cover or put in here that I haven't, uh, please let me know because I can update the article. How to start long-term food storage, the basics. So again, this article focuses on creating a do-it-yourself stockpile of staple foods and the principles necessary to store them for the long term. Um, I came up with this information when researching for my family's long-term food storage, and I hope that this information helps you as you build your own emergency food supply. So let's get down to it. You can see the table of contents here. Um, if you're looking for something in particular, you can just scroll down and you can click to get right to it if you're on the article, right to that subject matter. The following are 32 principles to think about as you plan your long-term food storage. Use these principles as a springboard for more extensive research and planning. Plan long-term food storage for the num number of people in your group. Consider your most likely emergency scenario such as nat a nat natural catastrophe or life event and plan your emergency food storage for your specific situation. So determine how many people you're storing food for. Determine how long you want to store food for, how long you want your food store to last. Um, it can be overwhelming, so start small, maybe with the Federal Emergency Management Agency's uh, three-day uh, food supply, and plan for special diets and medical issues. To get an idea of the types of foods you may want to store, think about the kinds of foods you or your family already eat. If your family loves food that can be packaged for a long shelf like, like rice or pasta, it's a food you should consider storing. Consider calorie count and nutrition for long-term storage. Planning daily calorie count and choosing foods that give you well-rounded nutrition are the most challenging aspects, in my mind, of a long-term food storage program. And I think also menu planning is also challenging to keep to shake it up and to keep it different, keep it interesting, and to kind of deal with that psychological aspect of um, prepping and long-term survival. Uh, FDA calorie counts, as you guys know, anybody that's actually already familiar with this, FDA calorie counts are all over the map. They're, you know, they're kind of depend on, dependent on body type, how many calories you're actually expending, depending on like what you're doing. Are you chopping firewood? Are you jogging? Are you working in the garden? Or are you just sitting in a, a chair fishing? So FDA calorie count, um, I'm using this as a base so that you've got to have, you got to pick something. You got to pick a number. So. Uh, 1,600 to 2,400 calories per day for women and 2,000 to 3,000 calories uh, per day for men. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when you're, when you're uh, planning your food storage, you want to consider both of these things. Nutrition, you're getting well-rounded nutrition. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you also want to consider um, the daily calorie count. Uh, daily nutritional requirements. Um, this is, I got this off of Ke uh, kaiserpermanente.org. Uh, carbohydrates should be 50 to 60 percent of your daily calorie count. Proteins 12 to 20 percent, and fats 30 percent. Um, there's going to be a lot of people. I shouldn't say it that way. If you're doing something special, like uh, a paleo diet, a primal diet, um, if you're doing a low cat, uh, low carb, low fat diet, you're going to have to determine how you're going to make your food stores. You're going to have to determine what kind of foods that you want to want to pick. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I'm not a professional. I'm not a doctor, so I can't tell you what to do with your own diet. Uh, malnutrition. This is something that you want to avoid. Five side effects to avoid in your long-term food storage. 
these are side effects of mal malnutrition. These are just five of them. There are, are many more, and there's different kinds depending on what you're um, what you're lacking in your diet. So the best way to deal with this is just to make sure you have a well-rounded food storage program. So you're in a survival situation and long term, let's say you don't have power. You've got to work out in the garden. You're out trying to um, trade some of the items that you have stocked in your emergency survival uh, food storage area, you know, whatever that may be, ammo, some kind of food type, your skills, and bam, you don't have a well-rounded uh, food storage. You're not getting the right nutrition, so you have a loss of energy. You have the reduced ability to focus. You have reduced physical performance. You have altered moods, which is going to affect the cohesion of the group, and it's also going to affect your own uh, the psychology aspect of survival and you're gonna have an inability to concentrate. These are five things that you definitely don't wanna to have to deal with any more than you have to in a survival situation. So uh, make sure you've got you know, food stores that are giving you what you need. One good way to deal with this, <clears throat> excuse me, and this article is really not focused on what you should buy necessarily or what you should store, but um, food supplements are a really good way to go to make sure that you have what you need. Like. Um, you know, vitamin C and a multivitamin. That's a good way to, to uh, fill the gaps. For an in-depth discussion of malnutrition, read the World Trade, World Trade Organization's fact sheet. You can click here if you're uh, actually reading the article. Check out the comprehensive YouTube video, How Much Food to Store for Each Person, to get a more detailed, uh, to get more detailed information on the daily calorie count and nutritional requirements provided by the Food and Drug Administration. This has probably been my most popular video and article. I think the you, I, mean, I have a tiny YouTube channel. I think this has already got like 15,000 views. So people must be getting something out of it. So go check it out. Um, stock foods you eat. A common mistake new preppers make is storing foods that they haven't tried. You know, I, I, even I do. I get excited about, oh, I'm going to get a 50-pound bag of something. I'm going to get a 100-pound bag of something. And that's probably not the best way to go about it. And here's the reasons why. Uh, you don't want to find out on the back end that you bought a 50-pound bag of untested food that nobody will eat, and I've done it. So you're either going to throw it out, feed it to the birds, or you're going to donate it. Purchase foods you eat on sale and in bulk. It reduces your overall cost. So that goes back to the whole idea that prepping or uh, having a large food pantry, a long-term storage food pantry, is really an excellent way to save money because you can buy stuff again in bulk and you can buy it when it's on sale. Stock foods you eat to minimize wasting storage space. Uh, I bought a massive bag of quinoa. I said something about that in the other article and nobody, including me, would eat it. It was way too um, uh, bitter for me. It's got a thing called saponins. It's actually a chemical that the plant has so the birds won't eat the seeds. Well, guess what? It worked on me too because I don't want to eat it either. Okay, so stock foods you eat or you're wasting money. I guess that's obvious, but it's something to think about. Purchase small quantities of untested food to see if it works in your pantry. So if you think you want to use something but you haven't eaten it, buy a small amount. Try it. Make sure everybody will eat it. Staple foods, thing, another thing to consider when you're creating your long-term um, food storage. Staple foods are the cornerstone stone of long-term food storage. Staple foods make up a significant, significant portion of your standard prepper diet. They provide a majority of your calories and nutrition. <clears throat> Excuse me. When planning your long-term preps, store staples like rice, wheat, pasta, dried bean, and pulses, which are... Um, Oh, I'm, not, I'm not even going to be able to think of what it is now. I eat them all the time. <laughs> well, I'll get back to that because I'm going to sit here and hum and ha. Uh, look up pulses. And, you know, it's like a bean, but it's not. They cook faster. They're good. They have a ton of amino acids. Not a ton of calories, but a ton of uh, amino acids. So think of staples as the bedrock of food prepping. This is kind of like the staples are like the framework. Or if you're building a castle, it's the, the foundation, the solid, hard foundation and then all of your other long-term and short-term food items can be built around and on top of that. Uh, interesting fact, rice is a staple food of more than half of the world's population. More than 3.5 billion people depend on rice for more than 20% of their daily, daily calories. And I got that off of ricepedia.org. This is just an overview. This is not a comprehensive list. It's 31 foods for your emergency pantry. Um, it just, it's, it's just kind of to say, okay, this is kind of what it looks like. 
if you think there's a food that you want in your pantry, you're going to have to research and see what how you store it and what the, the uh, longest shelf life you can get out of it is. Uh, long grain white rice, wheat, corn, like um, I'm thinking more like field corn, masa corn, uh, sugar, salt, instant potato flakes, dehydrated carrots. That goes for other dehydrated, dehydrated vegetables as well. Hard grains, uh, soft grains if they're properly processed. Uh, rolled oats, salt, sugar, baking soda, baking powder, white vinegar, dry pasta, dried beans, lentils, uh, non-fat dried milk, raw honey, soy sauce, dried herbs and spices, freeze-dried coffee, non-perishable canned foods, canned meats, canned fruits, canned vegetables, protein powder, peanut butter, lard, and leaven. Uh, some of these things are going to have, you know, if properly stored, they're going to have or properly stored and packaged, they're going to have a shelf life of, you know, five to 10 years. Some of them are going to have a shelf life of 30 years. Um, so when you think long-term storage, you know, you want your staples to have 30 years if you can get it, but the foods that you're going to be re rotating to keep your, your uh, meal plans interesting, you're not going to be able to just store foods that have a 30, you know, 25, 30, 20 year shelf life. You're going to have to incorporate foods that have shorter shelf lives and rotate them into your uh, regular food stock. And we'll talk about that down below. So here I say shelf life is based on hermetically sealed packaging as, uh, such as number 10 cans, mylar bags, food grade buckets, and the use of oxygen absorbers. Store-bought packaging will not give you the maximum shelf life that you can get out of a food. Tip, purchase large quantities of grains, dehydrated and freeze-dried foods, professionally packaged in number 10 cans or food grade buckets or learn to use mylar bags, oxygen absorbers, and five gallon food grade buckets to store your bulk food. Uh, many preppers will shake it up and do some of both. Um, okay, I wanted to get off on a tangent there, but I'm not going to. The best way to store rice long-term, this will just give you an, a, a general idea of, of how you're gonna look at that long-term storage. Um, I, rice is one of my staples. Rice and beans is the foundation of my um, long-term storage. I do want to move into wheat. I just, I don't have a wheat grinder yet, a hand grinder, so, or a wheat mill. So I haven't gotten into wheat yet, but that is definitely on the, uh, on the list. It's pretty easy to make your own yeast. It's pretty easy to grind your own grain. And with, with those two things together, that's pretty powerful in, a, um, in a prepper's pantry. Okay, so another thing that you want to do or consider when you are um, preparing or building a long-term uh, food storage is you want to rotate emergency food with what's called FIFO. This has been used for restaurants, uh, with restaurants or by restaurants for a long time. Uh, it's defined as first in, first out. Basically what that means is you're eating the oldest food, the oldest food first. So if you have 20 cans of corn, you're going to want to be eating the oldest can of corn, as long as it's still good, of course. You're going to be eating that next. So eat the oldest foods first. Following this rule is more important than canned, uh, with canned foods and foods with shorter shelf life. By rotating foods into your regular diet, you can reduce uh, foods lost by time. How to implement FIFO for storage. Mark your food with the date you stored it. Store similar uh, foods in the same area of your pantry. Keep an inventory of what you use so you can replace it. And that inventory can be pretty simple. You could actually um, just do an, use an, inf uh, an inventory uh, or just inventory the foods that you're taking out so that you replace them. Uh, if you're super type A, you could keep a, you know, you could keep a, a, a you know, a full blown spreadsheet and, and know exactly, you know, the dates, times, places and all that stuff. You could, you could uh, mark your shelves by category. Uh, there's a lot of ways to do it. Personally, uh, I'm not that person. I keep, I, I keep track of like what I use and, and replace it. Uh, put heavy foods towards the bottom of your storage. Uh, new foods go in the back, so you're pulling from the front. Again, the new food goes in the back. The old food is in the front. The oldest can is in the front, so you're pulling that out and using that next. Uh, redundant, but eat the old food, oldest food first. Replace foods as you use them. Purchase what you eat or you'll take up space and you won't rate, rotate. So if you buy a, a bunch of cans, of, let's say there's a, a canned chicken you don't like and you buy a bunch of it because you think it's like the Costco stuff, well, it's going to just sit there taking up space. You're not going to eat it. You're not going to be moving it out. You could have something in place of that chicken that you actually use. 
keep your storage area clean uh, to keep bugs and rodents out or away. Don't use damaged cans or cans that are bulging. Don't eat any foods that have an off or foul odor. Don't eat any foods that don't look or smell right. This one here is kind of crazy because I'm going to guess that 90% of preppers don't actually have uh, the ideal food environment. So really think about this more in terms of what you really don't want to do and pick the best location, uh, you know, the location that you have that, that is best for storing your foods. So do the best you can to store food in an optimum environment. Avoid hot garages, sheds, or any place with uncontrolled temperatures. The environment described below is ideal for food storage, but may, may not be attainable. And probably isn't attainable, but it gives you an idea of what you're shooting for. Uh, the storage area is clean and dry with adequate, adequate ventilation to prevent high humidity. A dry storage climate will keep mold ba and bacteria from growing. 50 degrees is the optimum temperature for food storage. 70 degrees will work. Any, anything higher than this may reduce shelf life. Um, yeah, I mean, who's gonna, there's not gonna be very many people that have an environment that they can keep at 70, 70 degrees, but I suppose it's possible. Uh, put a thermometer on the wall near your food storage so you can keep an eye on the temperature. Protect food from heat and light. These are two things uh, that you really want to try to do. Um, both of these things will increase oxidation and decrease shelf life. So uh, one big thing is don't uh, store supplies next to hot appliances or a furnace. Keep your food up off the floor and away from the wall for good air circulation. And do not store food or water close to any chemicals. Um, you know, you think you've got a 55-gallon drum of water or you have a plastic pail of rice and it's sitting next to some kind of solvent, that solvent can actually transfer through the plastic and into the food. Uh, keep an eye out for pests and infestations and use control measures if necessary. Keep pantry area clean to reduce possibility of infestation. So don't build your pantry and forget about it. You know, check it out once in a while, especially if it's in the basement. Sure, where should I store my emergency food supply? There's so many different scenarios. There are people living in condos, people living in apartments, you know, people living in 3,000 square foot houses without buildings and barns and you know, uh, 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 root cellars and stuff like that. So these are just some general ideas to, to get, your, you know, get your juices flowing. So 11 locations you can store your long-term emergency food supply. In the basement on heavy duty shelving, build shelves for, from dimensional lumber or uh, purchase prefab shelving, something like Gorilla Racks, not cheap. Uh, in your closets, um, I, most of us use all the space we have. So this is something that you're gonna have to like really actively <laughs> try to do. And I say good luck with that. But closets, you can consolidate what you have stored and get rid of stuff you don't use like old clothing. Uh, excuse me. Under beds, uh, inside plastic totes, uh, you can create wall shelving units or, or use ones that you have for extra and use the wall space. Uh, cabinets and pantries, uh, root cellar. Most of us, this isn't an option, but it's a pretty good option if you have the resources uh, to build one. Uh, you can bury storage in the ground. I've never done this, but it's kind of a cool idea. Uh, use like a waterproof container, like an old refrigerator or freezer and leave the door above ground. Uh, hide it by covering with a board or burlap. Um, get the footstools, you know, like the kind that you have, uh, is it called an ottoman? You know, the big footstools that have the lids that pop up um, and couches also that have storage compartments and you can pack food in there. Um, you can pack food in uh, empty luggage or backpacks. Uh, look for nooks and crannies like under stairs and crawl spaces uh, in an old camper, or trailer, or an outbuilding. Of course, you know, some of these things are not temperature controlled, so you got to be careful what you store in those areas. Survival tools and equipment don't need to stay cool, dry, and dark, so they can be stored in a garage, shed, or detached storage units that aren't climate controlled. And uh, oxygen is the enemy of food storage. Oxidation is a term used to describe the reaction between oxygen and a food product. 
Um, when oxygen is present in a food container, it supports the growth of microorganisms and causes changes in color, off odors and flavors in packaged foods. It's one type of spoilage or food degradation. So oxygen reduces the shelf life of your food. So two main goals when it comes to oxygen and food storage, remove, remove one, remove oxygen from the storage container, and two, keep oxygen out of a food container. So my preferred method of doing this is uh, using oxygen absorbers, and I have down below a chart that uh, tells you how many oxygen absorbers to use for the most common food storage containers. So I use oxygen absorbers because they're easy, but um, I've actually interested in dry ice. I'm getting ahead of myself, uh, but I talk about that down below. Uh, keep oxygen out of a food container. This is achieved by using quality food grade container that keeps the seal and isn't easily damaged. Uh, for instance, mylar bags by themselves are easily damaged, but pair them with a lidded food grade bucket and you've got a solid oxygen barrier that isn't easily damaged. Oxygen absorbers in long-term food storage. Properly used oxygen absorbers absorb oxygen and effectively reduce the aerobic environment in a container to 0%. Packaging and the container seal are critical for oxygen absorbers to work. Five things oxygen absorbers can do, I should say can do, in food container because, you know, you have to properly package the food. Uh, an O2 free environment kills bugs, bug eggs, pupae, and full-grown bugs within two weeks. Uh, oxygen absorbers uh, protect the quality of dry food and eliminate oxidation. An oxygen-free storage environment drastically reduces the rate at which foods go bad. Think in terms of decades and uh, uh, decades of added shelf life. Aerobic bacteria and fungi can't grow. Food is not crushed like it is with vacuum packing, and vacuum packing is not actually is not effective in removing uh, a majority of the oxygen. So. I'm not saying you can't vacuum pack, but you're not gonna get the same kind of shelf life you are with O2 absorbers or, or some of the other methods. Fact, a food package leak makes an oxygen absorber useless. The contents inside the package will have a reduced shelf life and will be more susceptible to bugs like beetles and weevils. Tip, a food storage container like Mylar bags in conjunction with food grade buckets or pails is suggested to ensure a food container is not physically damaged, breached, uh, damaged and breached by oxygen. How many oxygen absorbers do I need for food storage? The number and size of oxygen absorbers you need in a food storage container are determined by the volume of air inside the container after it is filled with food. And I've got charts down below, again, that give you the most common uh, storage containers and how many oxygen absorbers you should use. The vol okay, so two things that determine how many oxygen absorbers you need in a food storage container, the volume of oxygen in your container when it is full of dry goods, and the size of the absorber, which determines how much cubic centimeters of oxygen is removed from the container. Oxygen absorbers are rated in cc's for their capacity to remove oxygen. So if a container has 300 cc's of oxygen, you'll need an absorber that has at least a 300 cc capacity to remove the oxygen. Using too many absorbers, or absorbers will not hurt the food. I err on the side of safety and usually do overkill with oxygen absorbers. And that information is provided by Sorbent Systems Impact Corporation. They make uh, one brand of oxygen absorber. Recommended number of oxygen absorbers by food container type. I'm not gonna read through these. You can go over to readyscroll.com and take a look at the, um, the article. Uh, six gallon storage bucket. I have how many you need of each uh, size of absorber. Uh, five gallon storage bucket, uh, number 10 aluminum can, ball jars. This one is set up a little bit differently um, than the other ones, but it just seemed easier to change it up a little bit. But I have half pint, pint, quart, gallon, and five gallon uh, jars, and then the size of oxygen absorber that you'll need. Uh, Mylar food bags, I have the uh, dimensions, and I also have the, the gallon uh, ratio here. So it, it starts at... Uh, 4.255 and 6 gallon, and I go all the way down to, here we go, uh, I go all the way down to a quarter gallon, how many absorbers you need. So if you need that information, go for it. And that information is compliments of USASupply.com. I say here, note these are average amounts at sea level. You may need more or less depending on individual conditions and the remaining residual volume of air. 
There is no danger in adding too many oxygen absorbers as this does not affect the food. Oxygen represents 20% of the total volume of air, and the number in cc's above represents the amount of oxygen that would be absorbed. So if you're into math and you want to do this yourself, head over to PackFresh and learn how to calculate oxygen absorber requirements based on container volume. <clears throat> and you can click here on the article and it'll take you over to their, their science and math uh, page. Heat is the enemy of long-term food storage. Heat plays a significant excuse me, heat plays a significant role in degrading both food and food packaging. Avoid storing food in outdoor sheds, hot garages, or next to utilities or appliances that put off heat. Avoid heat. Avoiding heat will add years to the shelf life of your food. Uh, I hit down here I have an interesting example uh, from the Armed Forces Pest Management Board. And this is for me MREs, Meals Ready to Eat. That's a um, military ration. Uh, so MRE, approximate storage life. At 60 degrees, seven years. At 70 degrees, it'll last five years. At 80 degrees, an MRE will last four years. At 90 degrees, it will last 30 months. And at 110 degrees, it'll last five months. So that just shows you what heat does to shelf life. And uh, I've, I've, I wrote an article on MREs that I think is pretty interesting. Um, you can click here to see that article, to read that article. Light causes the oxidation of food. If food is stored in sunlight or UV light, shelf life is reduced. It also hastens the deterioration of some food packaging. Light oxidation is mainly an issue if you're storing food in clear packaging like ball jars or uh, the recycled peat bottles. If you're using clear packaging for food, store it in a dark location or cover it. Fact, with sunlight usually comes heat, which is another thing that destroys your food, so just keep that in mind. Moisture is the enemy of long-term food storage. Two concerns when it comes to moisture and food storage. One, dry goods should have a moisture content of less than 10% before they're packaged because most long-term preppers store grain whole and grind it as they use it. Leaving grain whole isn't just for shelf life. It also, it's also for food safety. Foods like flour are susceptible to botulism if they're stored with high moisture content. The storage environment itself should have no more than 55% humidity. Warning, dry goods packaged with moisture content higher than 10% can lead to botulism poisoning. Poisoning is rare, but it's deadly. Foods high, on, high in oil and lipids have a short shelf life, or shorter anyway. Foods that have high oil content oxidize much quicker than uh, those that don't. Consider this, long grain white rice will store 30 plus years in number 10 can because it has a low oil content. Brown rice, on the other hand, has a high oil content because the husk is still on the rice grain. It has a maximum shelf life, even if stored in number 10 cans of 18 months. So this kind of brings up another good tip. You want to know, I would avoid mixing foods when you store them. Like I wouldn't, you know, if you, if you didn't know about this, you might think it's a good idea to store brown rice and white rice together. And you know that all of the food in the container would have, even if white rice is mixed in, would have 18 months. This is, again, just to get your juices flowing, this is definitely not an exhaustive list. Eight foods that are not ideal for long-term storage. I say this is just a primer. There are a lot of foods that aren't the best choice for long-term storage, but barley, any grain that is pre-milled other than rolled oats, granola, beef jerky, nuts, brown rice, brown sugar, dehydrated fruits and vegetables, unless they are sufficiently dried to snap when bent. Uh, say freeze-dried food may be a better option. Protect your food against bugs and rodents. Kill bugs in food storage. Most grades, grains have bugs when you purchase them, um, but it's a problem that you can solve. Kill bugs by removing oxygen. Kill them with heat or freeze them. Uh, you can use oxygen absorbers to create an oxygen-free environment that kills bugs at all stages of life, and that's kind of an issue. You know, some methods will kill bugs when they're adults. Some will kill them when they're adults and eggs. Uh, some won't kill the pupa. So keep that in mind when you're looking at how you want to kill the bugs in your food storage, your uh, dry goods. Dry ice, the solid, which is a solid form of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is effective in ki killing weevils and beetles. 
freezing freezing is suitable for small batches or if you have a freezer if you have the uh, the freezer if you have freezer space oh my gosh that was a mouthful for me depending on what you read freeze grains anywhere from three days to two weeks it's i read quite a bit on this and it's all over the charts so you're going to have to uh, do some research and make your own determination there baking bake grain in an oven at 120 degrees for one hour to kill weevil eggs and mature weevils five ways to keep rodents out of your food storage i don't know that you if you're in an area where this is a problem you probably can't keep them out altogether but you can be vigilant and you can control the situation uh, rodents are pretty nasty. The source of black plague in the 14th century was rat droppings. Keep rodents from showing up or eliminate them. Keep your pantry, pantry clean, set traps, get some barn cats on patrol, use number 10 cans to store food, use mylar bags in conjunction, in conjunction with sealed food grade buckets. Just to be aware that mice, if they're hungry enough, will chew through food grade buckets. Uh, here's an interesting fact. A female mouse can have five to 10 litters per year averaging six to eight babies that's 30 to 80 new mice per year from one female and these numbers are actually conservative um, the conservative averages uh, some female mice can have up to four, 14 babies in a litter so that's a lot of a lot of babies uh, here's kind of a little antidote i was on a camping trip in the boundary water canoe area and i had a mouse chew the through the bottom of my tent and through a military grade canvas bag to get to my food and it did this in one night mice will chew through just about anything if they're hungry enough stay vigilant so you can control an infestation protect long-term food uh, storage from flooding the last thing you want to happen is to have a flood or hurricane surge taking out your entire food store there is no perfect scenario here but do your best to get the food up off the ground at a bare minimum, store emergency food and water on a pallet. If you're in an area where you think you're safe from groundwater or storm surges, consider that something as simple as a leaking freezer line or a leaking window can put, six down, uh, put down six inches of water quickly. A lot of people that if you have ba a lot of people that have basements store their emergency food in the basement. I just moved uh, to Florida, so I went from having a, a pretty good sized basement uh, where I stored most of my food. Now I don't. So I'm using a, a closet. Uh, food container size for long-term food storage. Uh, if you're storing food for long haul, avoid using grocery store packaging for things like pasta and rice because you won't get a maximum shelf life. Uh, it's okay to use that packaging if it, for shorter term things for like, uh, you know, if, if it's stuff that you're rotating, um, but for the long term, for the long run, for the long haul, for that 30 year shelf life, you're not gonna wanna use store packaging. Also consider the size and weight of the container when it's full. A 55 gallon drum of water weighs 458 pounds and a five gallon pail of rice weighs approximately 36 pounds. Uh, things to consider with long-term food storage containers. Uh, small containers are more convenient and lightweight so they're easier to move around and store. Small containers reduce the amount of food exposed to the environment when opened. Containers that fit together or stack will minimize the amount of space used for storage, i.e. square buckets instead of round buckets. Large containers like five or six gallon pails are going to expose a lot of food when opened. To remedy this, package large quantities of dry food in small quarter to one gallon mylar bags and place them in a food grade bucket. As you open one bag, the remaining packs will still be sealed and protected by the pail. Mylar bags, food grade buckets, and oxygen absorbers, probably the best option for more, most preppers. And I say this because it's probably the simplest and it's probably the most available. The equipment is pretty inexpensive compared to number 10 cans and it's easy to do it yourself. And the materials necessary are readily available online. Six reasons to use Mylar bags, a bucket, and oxygen absorbers together. Removes all oxygen from the container, kills bugs at all stages of life, including eggs and pupa. Allows you flexibility in the size of mylar bags you use. Protect mylar bags from physical damage because they're in a bucket. Protects uh, from light. And allows you to choose the shape of your bucket to maximize space. Five reasons to choose number 10 cans for long-term food storage. They're tough. They take an excellent seal. They create a quality oxygen barrier. They keep out light, 
they store a manageable amount of food and they are mouse and rat proof. Whoops, typo. Number 10 cans are expensive, but they're excellent for food storage. So if you can afford it and if you have the resources, number 10 cans are the best are the best food storage container, I believe. But the most reasonable, the most available, what's gonna fit most people's situation is the Mylar bags, buckets, and oxygen absorbers. You can find cans from uh, multiple survival food companies and you can buy pre-packaged foods from LDS, Latter-day Saint canneries. I'm not LDS, but they are outstanding when it comes to long-term food storage. All, I think all of the best resources I've found have all been uh, LDS stuff. Uh, and I actually have a link to uh, a PDF article down below that's uh, um, a preparation manual that's outstanding. So uh, if you're looking for something that you want to print out, take a look at it. Uh, another 10 can option. I, I was... I was operating under the assumption that you couldn't do your own number 10 cans at home, but you can. There's a unit out there. Gehring & Son out of Idaho offers a canning unit you can purchase to dry pack your grains in number 10 cans. Uh, you can click here from the article. I'm not affiliated with this company in any way, but it's the only dry canning unit I could find. I did watch one video on it, and it got good reviews. And the person that was in the video appeared to be an actual uh, a person who was actually doing um, volume uh, prepping. Other food storage options, ball jars, peat, polyethylene, uh, terra phthalate, sterilized reclaimed soda bottles basically, vacuum packing, food grade buckets with lids, uh, mylar bags. Yeah, th this seems redundant. You can use these by themselves. You don't have to use them together. Don't store food in containers that are mark uh, that are not marked as food grade. You may get chemical leaching and certain plastics do not create a quality air barrier. I should have added there, if you're reusing uh, containers, make sure, even if you know that there's food grade in, like for instance, if you're using a soda bottle, make sure that they're disinfected and that you get all the sugar and stuff out of there. Um, and you also want to try to get it, uh, get all the material out of there so it doesn't transfer any kind of flavoring to whatever you're storing in there. Uh, I've got an article that talks about food grade plastic for storage. You can click there and uh, if you want to read about that. Uh, plan to prepare and cook food in a power out scenario. So you've got, you know, two, three thousand pounds of food. The power goes out and you don't have a way to cook it or prepare it. You're in a world of hurt. So it's something you have to consider. In a uh, shit hits the fan scenario, you're probably going to be without power. Try to have a plan to prep and cook without the power grid. The most challenging food preparation scenario, in my mind, you guys could point something else out, but it's blizzard-like conditions, especially if you don't have a way to heat your home because you won't want to go outside and let cold air inside the house. Here are some no power cooking options for inside and outside. Uh, seven outdoor cooking methods. Uh, I may have missed some in here, so if you see anything I missed, let me know. Small backpacker style stoves. These are all to be used outside not inside, not an enclosed space. Uh, Coleman style camp stoves, wood fire and cast iron, uh, indoor fireplace, outdoor propane grill, outdoor charcoal grill and solar oven. Uh, five indoor cooking methods. Uh, these are things you can use indoors with if you take care and make sure that there's proper ventilation. Uh, alcohol stoves. Uh, the bad thing about alcohol stoves is if you, like say you spill it, you knock it over, the alcohol will continue to burn. You'll have like a big flame on the counter or the floor or whatever the alcohol spills on. So use great care with alcohol stoves and they do not give off a lot of heat. Sterno, uh, it's jelly denatured alcohol. So these Sterno cans are quite a bit safer in my opinion than the alcohol stoves. But uh, again, not a ton of heat, but you can definitely heat a can of chili or beans with Sterno. Uh, portable butane stove. I don't want to say this is controversial, but I'm going to say that there's nothing I can find that says, hey, go ahead and use a butane stove in your house. But I do know, one, caterers use them. And two, I know that a lot of Asian countries like Korea, Japan, uh, they use a ton of, they use butane stoves in their, in their apartments to cook their meals. A lot, of, a lot of people do. You can also use candles and you can use uh, MRE flameless heaters. Uh, just be aware that portable stoves create carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. 
please do not use them indoors or in an enclosed space. Every year people die putting uh, um, stoves that aren't rated inside their tent. So just be aware of that. And please be aware that uh, the use of open flame indoors is a fire hazard. Read the safety instructions on any stove you use. Tools that don't require power. I didn't want to write a list here because I just I did an article, 44 tools and gadgets that don't require power that you can go check out. Um, consider collecting tools that will help you function when the power is out. You will need methods to process food, distribute water, and carry out daily tasks like sanitation. So go check this out. Don't forget water in your emergency pantry. Okay, I'm going to say it. I feel like I say this a lot. You can last two weeks without food, but three, maybe four days without water. Water should be your first consideration when it comes to, to survival in your pantry. Eight things to consider. Emergency water storage. Store wa uh, water for post or pre-treatment in 55-gallon blue barrels or other large food-grade containers. You don't want to depend on filtration or purification of water after it is contaminated because most, me most methods of cleaning water will not remove chemicals. Groundwater, municipal water, and well water are often contaminated during flooding or groundwater surges from tropical storms and hurricanes. So if you don't have water that you can remove the biological agents from uh, and you're using water out of the tap or from your well after it's contaminated and it's got chemicals, you have to have, uh, basically you have to have a reverse osmosis system. Water catchment and uh, storage for rainwater, purify with chemicals, filter, or boil. Uh, you can use store-bought water, water or bottled water. It's suitable for hydration and short-term emergency, but not really for long-term survival because you can't get enough volume. Uh, water filtration. I'm a firm believer in having a method to filter water. Store as many backpack filters and bulk water gravity filters as you can afford. This way you can filter water from natural sources if necessary. And guess what? If the groundwater, all the groundwater around you is is got chemicals in it, you know, you, I don't see, and I'm not suggesting this, but I don't see any other way other than you're going to have to, you know, do your best to find water without chemicals. You're going to have to, you're going to have to treat it for biological agents, and you're going to have to drink it. You don't want to boil it though. Boiling water kills biological and vi viral contamination if water is boiled for three minutes. However, boiling water does not remove chemicals, but actually increases the concentration of chemicals in the remaining volume of water. So you're boiling the water. That water that's going off in steam is clean, um, but unless you're capturing that, you can't drink the water that remains in the pan because there's there's a higher and higher concentration of chemicals in that pan as the water boils. Uh, iodine kills biological and viral, viral contaminants but does not remove chemicals. Ultraviolet radiation will effectively remove biological agents and waterborne viruses but not chemicals. Uh, you can purify water with bleach or pool shock. It will kill biological and viral agents, but does not remove chemicals. Beating a dead horse here, but fact, most methods of cleaning water do not remove chemicals. If you're in a situation where you have contaminated municipal water, groundwater, or well water, bulk water storage is a lifesaver. Two ways to remove chemicals from emergency drinking water, reverse osmosis, uh, ROS, reverse osmosis, doesn't require electricity but does need water pressure. So if the municipal water system is down, you're out of luck. Uh, not all ROS systems will remove all chemicals. And I'll, I'll be honest, these systems are kind of complicated. So you're going to want to do a lot of research if you want to put one of those systems in. Uh, distillation, a method of boiling water and collecting the evaporated water for drinking. Again, boiling water doesn't remove chemicals. I'm going to be looking into this more. Um, hopefully doing a, an article just on distilling water because I'd also like to be able to distill seawater because I'm I live you know two blocks from the not from the ocean but from the back bay I live pretty close to the Gulf for everything emergency water read ready squirrels comprehensive article how long will emergency water last I talk about a lot of things in there uh, you might find it useful I have ratios of bleach to water and stuff like that there's some charts in there that you might find useful useful uh, commercially packaged survival foods you can supplement your emergency food store or create your entire pantry from commercial foods packaged for long-term food storage but it's going to be expensive 
uh, when purchasing survival food, please, please do some research so you're familiar with what you're getting. Try to understand the portions and the calorie count you're purchasing. Some package deals may sell a food supply for X amount of time or X amount of calories or days, but this may be deceiving, so do your research. Uh, I, just like with uh, the bulk food items, I suggest if you're going to buy commercially packaged uh, survival food, buy it in small quantities first and, and try it out, see if you want to eat it. Uh, types of commercial survival food, uh, freeze-dried food, that's an excellent way to supplement for certain situations like bugging out on foot. Uh, freeze-dried re food retains over 90% of its nutritional value and it's super lightweight. Professionally packaged freeze-dried meals from companies like Mountain House have a shelf life of 30 years. I'm not affiliated with Mountain House, but I've used the product and I know it's solid. Uh, freeze-dried meals require boil water to reconstitute, so consider water and fuel supplies in your prepping. The downside to freeze-dried food is it's expensive. No matter how you look at it, it's, it's got some price to it. You can freeze-dry your own f uh, food with units like Harvest Right. That's kind of like the industry standard for preppers, the, that unit is. They have different units, but that company, they make the most popular uh, freeze-dry units. The units are expensive, but uh, I'll be honest, the prices are actually going down on these. Um, so keep an eye out. If you're in this for the long haul, then a freeze-dry unit is worth looking into, especially if you use it regularly. The amount of meat and other foods you can buy in bulk and on sale would pay for the unit in a re relatively short time frame. Uh, to learn more about freeze-dried food, read Ready Squirrel's article, What, free what is Freeze-Dried Food? You can click here on the article. Uh, meals Ready to Eat, originally designated as military food ration. MREs are now made for civilians. You might, may find a use for these in your pantry, especially for bugging out in a vehicle as an emergency catch or stored at an off-grid location. MREs are bulky, uh, bulky so not the best option uh, for bug out bags. So they're also he pretty heavy. To learn more about MREs, you can read Ready Squirrel's comprehensive article, What is an MRE? Dehydrated foods, a list of companies that uh, supply bulk survival food. Uh, dehydrated foods and freeze-dried foods are completely different um, food processing techniques, and I think people get confused. confused. Uh, de dehydrating food is um, like using a freeze dryer to remove moisture. Uh, freeze drying is called sublimation, and I've, I've got it. You can go read the article on that. It's, it's pretty technical, but uh, the two are not created equal. Freeze dried food lasts much longer in, in most cases than dehydrated food does. And dehydrated food that's professionally processed more likely than not is going to last much longer than food that you dehydrate yourself just because of the type of dehydration units that are being used, you know, commercial versus like a home unit. Um, list of companies that supply bulk uh, survival food. I don't have an affiliation with any of these. I just thought it's a good, again, get the brain juices flowing, give you some stuff to look up. This isn't exhaustive and I don't claim any of these companies uh, are better than the others. You can use the list to do a little research. ReadyWise, Augustin Farms, Mountain House, My Patriot Supply, Legacy. Uh, Numana has an organic food, uh, Thrive Life, Backpackers Pantry, and Valley Food Storage. Uh, here's an excellent resource you should check out. LDS Preparedness Manual, PDF. You can download it and print it. And a guide to food, uh, food storage from Utah State University. Uh, I should put that as a PDF. That's also a PDF you can download and uh, and print it if you'd like to. Let me know if I missed anything. Uh, let me know if there's any uh, uh, anything that you would add to the article or any suggestions that you would make. Uh, I, you know, I try to keep my articles under 4,000 words. This was 4,900 words. So, um, I, you know, I, I could have gone down the rabbit hole. I could have written a book on this stuff. So, I uh, appreciate you guys listening to me. Gab, you have a great uh, great day. Take care of you and yours, and I will talk to you next time. Take care, folks.